let's start with you. Yeah, 2.1, number 9, part B. So I'm going to read this question here for everybody because I'm guessing that we don't all have a book in front of us. So here we're told or asked the point P comma one zero lies on the curve Y equals sine of 10 pi over X. So in the first problem or in part A, it asked us to find the slope of a bunch of secant lines that would approximate the slope at that point one zero or that we might want to use. In that we would have noticed that like this is not a doesn't seem to be helping me approach to a single value. You're getting stuff bouncing all over the place like positive and negatives and it doesn't look like it's being very cooperative. In part B it asks you to graph um, the thing and look at what's going on here um, and explain why the values you picked in part A were not helping you kind of come up with a slope. So this is the function sine of 10 pi over x. I'm graphing this from 0 to 2 because that was the um, the range of values that basically the, in part A they'd asked us to plug in was all stuff between 0 and 2. And I made the tick marks a tenth, and I even went in and put a, uh, turn the stat plot on to plot that point one zero. that is the, that's the point where we're looking for the slope at. So it would be easy to kind of see on the picture. So if we look at that, there's that point one zero is that square. And when we were picking the points before, you're getting like, you know, like things all over on these different amplitudes. And so nothing was like settling down to a value. Um, hopefully from the picture, what you would have realized is that the grain in part A, like the where we're using that building our table, the values we're using to build our table, just weren't close enough. So I really want to be between like 0.9 and 1.1. I need to pick my table values all in between that. I need to get really, really close to do that. Um, so that's what I would be doing in part C. Is that, oh, you had asked about part B, Paul, oh, right? Yeah, that kind of so that was, that, that was part B's answer, right? It's just kind of a like, here's the graph and I'm not looking at this, it's just like, it's so erratic, it doesn't really settle down into nice behavior that would approach that value until I get to like 0 0.9 or in between 0 0.9 and 1.1. So like that's where I would need to pick my values for my table. And if you do that, I did one side of it here. Um, so if I do 1.1, I get negative 2.8. 1.01, I got negative 30.06. 1.001, negative 31.3, negative 1.0001, I have negative 31.4, and I think that's probably, I didn't do the right-hand side, but it's, you can tell from the picture it's going to be, the right-hand side is going to be doing the same thing. And if you look at this, that makes sense, right? If I tried to draw a tangent line here, the slope should be negative, that line should be pointing down, right? And this is from 0 to 2, so like that is steep as heck. Like negative 31 slope, that jives pretty well with what I'm looking at in my picture. Um, and again, since this is like an approximation, I would say if you're like, if I was grading this, if you were like 2 tenths or so on either side of negative 31.4, I would say that's a pretty good estimate. That would be reasonable. So like negative 31.2 to negative 31.6. If you had anything kind of in that neck of the woods, I'd be like, yeah. Especially if it's said to like estimate it to the tenth or something, I'd probably be specific on a question like this that was um, a, a little bit more specific than they were. But does that, Paul, does that feel good as to like what to do here? Yeah, just kind of like talking it through. Um, it's hard to like look at exactly what's going. What going on what would have probably been even more helpful when I did the graph was to put the scatter plot for all of the points 
that we generated so you can see like oh look at the slope for this you know like you're just not on you're not really close to where the tangent line should be when you have the points like you'd have a point here should be like finding this slope and then maybe you get a point down here so now you'd have that slope and it's just like it's not it's not the behavior is too erratic you weren't close enough to the point you're looking for for that for those to give you a good estimate um Blake. Um, so how would you do number 11? That's a 2-2 two, two problem, right? Yeah, 2-2. Two, two. Okay. Uh, let me go look at that. Oh, I see. Okay. So 2-2, two, two, number 11. And Paul, I didn't write anything down because it was like, I did all that problem with my calculator and just kind of looked at stuff. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so 2-2-11 two, two, is a little bit more of a write down problem because they, they need us to sketch a picture of the graph and I don't think that that would be something I could reasonably expect you to just kind of like do in your head while I talk through it and it's not really a calculator graphing question because um, they give us this piecewise function so So when you see something like this, this is called a piecewise function. Have we talked about these before? Maybe briefly or not really? Okay. So what a piecewise function is, is it's defining a function with like a discrete number of pieces. So like what this function is saying is for x's in our domain that are less than negative 1, this is how we draw the function. And when your x's are between negative 1 and positive 1, this is how we're going to draw the function. And when your x's are bigger than 1, this is how we're going to draw our function. Does that more or less make sense, trying to keep it relatively simple, the explanation there? So to graph this thing, I'm going to need to graph each one of these three pieces separately. And I'm going to do this by hand. Um, and I'm just going to kind of use an XY table to do this. So if I look at that first piece, what type of function is 1 plus X? Linear. How many points do I need to graph a linear function? Two. Now, here's the thing. One of those two points needs to be a certain point. Why? Because unlike a normal line, this is only a piece of a line. So we have to have where the line either starts or stops or maybe both. Now in this case, since my inequality is a one-sided inequality, I just need where the line is going to end, right? Where does the line end at? What value of x does it stop being a linear function at? Negative 1. So that has to be one of the x's I'm going to choose to do that part. When I plug negative 1 in for x, I get 0. And then I'm just going to pick some other value of x that's also less than negative 1. I'm going to do negative 2. So that gives me the point negative 1. Or negative 2, negative 1. So negative 2, negative 1. There's my point. Now, notice something here. If I look at the domain for the yellow, is negative 1 in the domain for the yellow? No, because it's x is less than negative 1. So what am I going to do when I plot the point negative 1, 0? Open circle. Very good. So there's my first piece. Everybody cool? So now I'm going to graph the green piece. If I look at the green piece, what kind of function is x squared? No. Quadratic. That's the word you're looking for. Yeah, you just got you got the wrong names. Yeah. It's okay. We got our names mixed up. It happens. You knew you knew what I meant though. Okay, quadratic. How many points do I need to graph a quadratic? 
at least three, right? One of those three has to be the vertex. Now you should be able to look at x squared and tell me what the vertex is. Zero, zero, right? Everybody's okay with that? Okay. Um, if not, what could you do to find the vertex if you didn't remember algebraically how to find it? Type it into your calculator and use like the minimum or maximum command, right? You just type the equation to the y equals and do the min or max and you'll find the vertex, right? If you're stuck, Jillian? If not, what is the equation to find it? The x-coordinate of the vertex is negative b over 2a, yeah. In this case, b is 0, so you just have 0 over 2, 0. And when I plug 0 in, I get 0, so. All right, what other two points do I have to pick? Or what other two x values do I have to pick for this? Negative 1 and positive 1. Why? Those are the bounds of that piece, right? That piece starts at negative 1 and it ends at positive 1. When I plug those in for x squared, I just get 1 for each of them. Everybody's cool? Okay. Am I moving at an appropriate pace here? You guys feel pretty good? Now, when I'm plotting these points, what do I have to be a little bit careful about? Yeah, 1, 1 is open, right? So there's my parabola there. And the last piece we'll do in blue. Now, you don't have to color code these pieces like I'm doing. I'm just doing it so that if you're going back and looking, it's a little bit more clear what it is that I did here. Um, what type of function is 2 minus x? Linear. How many points do I need? 2. What does one of the x values have to be? 1. So when I plug that in, I get 1. And when I plot the point 1, 1, am I going to use open or closed? Closed. Notice here that that fills in the open circle that was green. That's okay. And then I'll just pick another x value. I'll just pick 2. Okay. So the next part, it says sketch the graph. We did that. Everybody's happy with how we sketched that? Reasonable to do that again on your own, not too difficult. Just have to be a little bit careful. Um, it says, and use it to determine the values of A for which the limit as X approaches A of F of X does not exist. Or, I'm sorry, exists. Now, rather than thinking about the places it does exist, I'm going to just worry about the places it doesn't exist because that's going to be a way shorter list. And we'll just say everything except for the places where it doesn't exist. Right? Do you see any values for x that the limit would not exist at? Negative 1. Why? Yeah, it's, it's, you have a jump discontinuity there. The limit will not exist at a jump discontinuity, right? For sure. Because the left end is going to go to one value, the right end is going to go to a different value. That doesn't work. Everybody's cool? Is there any other places? No, right? Everywhere else, the left and right end meet at the same point. Everybody agree? Okay. So that's it. It's everything except for um, negative 1. So maybe you could write A is a member of the set negative infinity to negative 1, union negative 1 to positive infinity. That would be a nice neat technical explanation. You could write it in words. That wouldn't be wrong. Um, if this is like a multiple choice AP question, I'm sure they would use like an interval notation or something to describe the set. But this is just like a text, you know, like a homework question. So you don't have to go like notation crazy to do it. Amanda, I saw your hand earlier. Did you have something? I was About this one? Cool. I like it when I get two for the price of one. Three for the price of one. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Anise. Um, two point one, number seven. Yes. Sure. 
Go back. These all these 2.1 questions were like kind of involved, right? They all had like a table or something else attached to them, so I got to go back and read that. Uh, so it says the table shows the position of a cyclist. Well, at least in the seventh edition, it says the table <laughs> shows the positions of a cyclist. You know, t se you know after t seconds, so it's like the t is your like your x variable and the s is like your y variable. Uh, part A says find the average velocity for each time period. So velocity is just like distance traveled divided by time, right? So let's just do one of these. The first time period was 1, 3. So at 3 seconds, we've gone 10.7 meters. And at 1 second, we've gone 1.4 meters. And the total time elapsed there was 3 minus 1. So that's like your average velocity. What does this look like? Slow. Is that cool? I'll let you bang that through on the calculator, Anise, but that's the gist of it. You just do that over and over again, just using the values from the table. In part B, it says, use the graph of S as a function of T to estimate the instantaneous velocity when T equals 3. So here's a couple of different th ways you could do this. Um, my suspicion is the way that they would want you to do that is just to kind of use the average velocities to make an estimate. So what I would do is I would take the average velocity from like 2 to 3 and add the average velocity from 3 to 4 and just take the average of those two. So you're basically taking like, you know, if your graph kind of Say so like it looks like this, and here's your point. You're going, okay, I'm going to take this slope and then this slope and just kind of average them together, and I should be getting, you know, something that is pretty close. That's a reasonable way to have approached that. Um, also, what you could have done, if you were feeling fancy, you could have typed this data table into your calculator looked at the scatter plot, picked a regression equation, had the calculator generate that regression equation, and then use that to look at, or use that equation then to do like the same thing you did in number nine, where you made a table of values and looked at what those were approaching as you got closer and closer and closer to that point at, you know, 3, 10.7 or whatever. You're looking for the slope of the tangent line at 3, oh, which is the okay. same as the instantaneous velocity. Okay. The value at 3 is just going to be the position of the cyclist. You're looking at the sp for the speed of that cyclist at 3. Does that... And again, that, that right there is an issue throughout like all of introductory calculus for most students. It's like just getting a little bit confused. Are we talking about the value of a function or the slope of a function at a value, right? So it's we, we do need to be careful about that. And I'll try harder to be clear and consistent about how I'm verbalizing that. Um, and then the third thing you could have done, again, you could have taken that scatter plot, could have just sketched in a, a best fit line drawn in a tangent, just use the picture to estimate what the slope would have been. That would have been also like not a bonkers way of going about doing it. Probably not the most accurate thing in the world. But like at this point in section 2.1, that's not a bad, not a bad method to have gone about and tried. Any of those I think are appropriate. You'll probably get different answers depending on what you did because well, they're different. They're all estimates, you know. Anise, does that feel? Yeah. You feel happy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Paul. Right. Sure. That's the easiest question I'll get all day. Uh, 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 uh. All right. Uh, you guys ready to?
finish up 2-3 here. Mm -hmm. right. So when we had talked about 2-3, we had talked about our limit laws, and we talked about this direct substitution property that allows us to evaluate limits um, quite easily. So let's just look at a couple of examples now of just evaluating limits. Yes. There are uh, direct substitution properties. You said that uh, the two parts are connected. So for the second one, A is connected. Uh, so you just can't use it. And this is exactly what we're going to look at in these examples is what happens if I can't use direct substitution. What do we do then? So we have the limit as h approaches 0 of the quantity 3 plus h squared minus 9 all over h. The first thing I would do is try direct substitution. If I plug 0 in for h, what's going to happen? It's undefined because you're dividing by 0. What does that tell you? 0 is not in the domain of that function. Everybody's okay? So the limit laws are gone, can't use those. Direct substitution is gone, can't use those. What should I do instead? Well, I'm going to rely on algebra to try to simplify this down and see if I can cancel some stuff out and get rid of that h in the denominator. Because that's really the problem, right? So any ideas of what I might want to start by doing? Yeah, exactly. Good. So let's foil out that 3 plus h squared. That's what I would try first as well. And just a heads up, very common mistake students make is they drop, they start dropping their limit in front when we start doing these simplifying a limit. If you do that on the AP exam, they will, that will get marked off. You will not get marks for any calculation where you have limit equals and then the limit goes away at some point without actually evaluating the limit. That'll get, that will not get marks if you do that. I will be picky about that when we do written things. I'm just letting you know in advance that if you like, if that goes away, that's a problem, okay? Because you haven't evaluated a limit yet, right? We've just done some algebra. The limit's still there. We haven't dealt with it yet. Cool? Okay, so we did that. We expanded that parenthesis out, or expanded those exponents. What do you notice? Those nines will cancel out. I have a plus nine and a minus nine. Rad. Um, if I look at what's left, I have a 6h plus h. Those have a greatest common factor of h in them. Once I factor that greatest common factor, what can I do? Cancel the h's. And that was my key, right? All of a sudden, no h in my denominator. Now, can I do direct substitution? Yeah. So now the limit goes away because I did the direct substitution. So my answer is just 6. Very common, very common kind of trick to use to evaluate a limit. This very easily could be a like kind of question you have to do without a calculator, since obviously with a calculator you could look at the graph and probably come up with the answer pretty quickly. But this would be a very easy or very common kind of 
non-calculator active question. Everybody's cool? Okay. Um, let's do another. This one's going to be a little bit sneakier, but this is the sneaky stuff is like, that's once you've gotten sneaky, that's like mastering of calculus. If you've got, if you're really sneaky. All right. So we have the limit as t approaches zero of the square root of t squared plus nine minus three all over t squared. Can we do direct substitution as it's currently written? No, right? Okay. So we're going to have to do something else. Uh, what do you want to do? There's no obvious like simplifying that, can, that stands out, right? There's nothing to expand or whatever. What can we do with this? What about the square root? Oh, we can't break a square root at a plus sign, so you can't just do the square root of t and then the square root of 9. You can still get rid of the square root. Well, if you, if you do that, it also has to get multiplied to the negative 3. Yeah, yeah, and then it's not So you're talking about, okay, so Blake, you were saying to do this. Add ah, yes. Excellent. So what is this thing called here? Yeah, if this is the conjugate. And what we're doing here is we're just taking advantage of the difference of two squares factoring pattern. Right? So this is like my a minus b. And then this one would be like my a plus b. And why is this so advantageous? Why is this going to be quite helpful for us? It's going to get rid of the square root. Absolutely. Now it gets a little bit messy before it gets nice, but. That's sometimes the price we have to pay. Everybody happy with what we did there? Um, notice that, again, the advantage here is that the squared is going to cancel the square root in the numerator. So in the numerator, remember the limit, we're going to have t squared plus 9 minus 9 over, again, t squared times the quantity, square root t squared plus 3. If we look in the numerator, what do you see? Yeah, plus 9 minus 9, cancel them out. So we're left with just t squared in the numerator, which means we can, we can reduce the denominator with it. So we're just left with 1 over the limit, got to remember the limit, of 1 over square root t squared plus 9, plus 3. Can I do direct substitution on this? Yeah. If I just plug 0 in, there's no problems with that. Well, 0 plus 9 is 9. The square root of 9 is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. 
So we just have one sixth. That's not so bad. These two tricks of like expanding or multiplying by conjugate, tremendously common like tricks to evaluate a limit that cannot be or you, that you cannot use direct substitution with. Tremendously common. Okay? Everybody's cool? So far so good? Okay. Um, what about things that maybe there's no algebraic way to make it simpler and I still can't use direct substitution on it? What can I do with that? There's a theorem that we're going to use. This is called the squeeze theorem. Very common to see this as part of a free response question, having to apply the squeeze theorem. So this is one that you'll want to remember. Again, what does the equation sheet look like on AP Calc exam? Blank sheet of paper. So you got to remember all this stuff. I'll highlight some of these major ones, and maybe we'll start compiling a list or something in the content library of like major theorems and definitions to make sure that we know. Um, but we haven't gotten to much of that yet. This would be like the first thing I would have put on there, other than maybe like I don't know, like the definition of a limit, like. It's kind of obvious at this point. You don't, you'll use it so much that you're not going to not forget that the left hand limit has to equal the right hand limit that for the limit to equal, you know. Okay. All right. So the squeeze theorem says if f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x when x is near a, um, except oops, possibly at a, and the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of h of x, and that limit is L, then the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to L, provided something. What, what do we still have to have before we can say that that that's true. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at kind of the, a picture of what's really going on here because you read this and, yeah, you know, like maybe it's not like the uh, the clearest thing in the world as to what's going on, right? So I'm going to draw a little picture to kind of illustrate what it is that's what's happening here. So let's say that this is our value for A. So let's say we have some function F and some other function here. Oops. H. There's my function f and h. Notice that their limit at as x approaches a is the same. Everybody agree with that? If I have some poorly behaving function g, that is bounded by those two functions, its limit also has to be the same. Even if possibly, you know, like 
g was undefined at a, you know, and it was like we had like a discontinuity there. The limit's still going to be the same, right? Even if g is not actually less or between h and f at a, as long as it's everywhere near a, that's good enough. So like, so even if h of a, or h and f and g even if G is discontin discontinuous at A, that's okay. As long as it's G is between all of the value, or in between H and F for everywhere near A, that's fine. Squeeze theorem applies. Because here, if I look, is G between H and F at that value? No. But everywhere near it they are, that's good enough. That's okay, Stu. That's fine. Yep. As long as it's between near A. Yeah. If it is also at A, that's fine. If it's not, well, that's no problem. Okay. Jillian. Uh, no, they could certainly intersect, but not near A. Right, you should have like at least some little window around, some small window around A in yeah. which that inequality holds. Everybody's okay? Now I drew it where everything is fine, but like this could go like this. That's not a big deal. We just need a spot near A in which the inequality holds. Is that okay? So let's look at an example here. All right. So um, I'm going to do this as like a kind of a proof example. So I'm going to ask us to show that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine of 1 over x is equal to 0. First things first, can I use direct substitution on this? No, because you end up with 1 over 0, right? Okay. Can I use my limit laws on this? No, because one of the limits doesn't exist after I apply the limit law, right? Well, remember we, we looked at the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 1 over x. That didn't exist. That was one of the things we did, I think, in the earlier yeah. notes. I think we did, we wrote it as like pi over x or something, but it's like still going to be the same, same issue. Um, so what we're going to do here, we have to do something else. Neither one of those two things are acceptable routes to go. We can't use our limit laws. We can't use direct substitution. In that case, squeeze theorem is our next best tool. Okay? So we're going to need to create a function f of x and h of x that are going to bound x squared plus, or x squared times sine of 1 over x. Okay? So the piece that we're going to want to start with is just the sine piece. Okay? So let's just think about sine x. What's going to what values bound sine x? Think about the graph or think about the unit circle. 1 and -1. Very good. Sure. So if we looked at the graph of sine of x, it did this, right? Where this is 1 and this is negative 1. 
So like all the out, all the y coordinates on the graph of sine are in between negative one and positive one. Right? Does that feel good? Yes. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. So this is true, right? Everybody's clear as to why this is true. Pulling that, not trivial, the first time doing it. Having seen the example where, like, if there's a trig thing in it, I'm just going to start with the trig thing and the bounds for that trig thing. Helps enormously to see this trick. Um, but anyways, if this is true, then certainly that has to be true, right? If I take the sign of anything, it has to be between negative 1 and positive 1, right? Even if it's sine of 1 over x, it's still the sine of something. It's the, va the outputs, if there is one, has to be between negative 1 and positive 1. Everybody's okay? So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to build this thing we're taking the limit of now that I have an upper and lower bound for part of it. I'm just going to keep changing this until I have x squared times sine of 1 over x. Does that feel okay? What, what do you think I should do next? Great. How do you want to do that? Think about the easiest way possible to do it. To incorporate that x squared. Paul? You don't know? I'm really trying to think there, but it's just like an equation, right? This is an inequality. It's a two-sided inequality. I'm just going to multiply each part of the inequality by x squared, right? If I have 1 is less than 3 is less than 10, if I multiply everything by 2, that inequality will still hold, right? So I can do the same thing here. Very good. And now I have this inner piece of my inequality is the same as what I'm trying to take the limit of. So this piece now is my f of x. This piece now is like my h of x. Yep, the yellow is the f of x, right? If I go back to the theorem, the yellow is the lower bound function, and the, uh, the blue, I think, is the upper bound function. Right? That's all we're saying. So we've satisfied the first part of the squeeze theorem, right? Everybody's cool? Okay. So all I need now is to find the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared and the limit as x approaches 0 of positive x squared. Is that difficult? No. What can I use to evaluate those limits? Direct substitution. Right? I can just plug 0 in for x. Those are polynomials. And since those two are equal, I know then that by the squeeze theorem, the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine of 1 over x is also equal to 0. Really cool, right? You took what was going to be a limit that we couldn't do anything with algebraically, and you translate it into like two of the easiest limits you could possibly be asking ever to take. Just like this is direct substitution into like the least complicated looking thing I've ever seen. Um, 
just to illustrate kind of what's going on one more time. Um, let's just sketch in the picture here so you guys can see what this looks like. And then we'll go from like, I'll just do from negative 2 pi, go by pi over 2's. Oh, shoot. I want to go to positive 2 pi. And then my step is going to be pi over 2's. What did I do here? 2 pi. There we go. And that all, the rest of that should be, well, let's make that bigger. Okay. And I'm probably, I'm going to turn the axis off while I do this. Um, I'm going to turn the plot one on and just plot the point zero, zero so that there's like a little piece where we can see where the origin is. So there's the origin. There's my lower bound function. This is my x squared sine x function. And there's, uh, yeah, and there we go. That's kind of what we did. Is that cool? Uh, I mean, there are situations like that. Um, would probably be on the scope of this class. Okay. Um, is that okay with you guys? So what is the hardest part of using the squeeze theorem? What's the hardest part going to be? Yeah, I think... I think Paul or uh, John's right on it is like finding this relationship is typically going to be the hardest part. Once you found that though, your limits that you have to take usually are very easy because you want to get like some polynomial piece that you can just do direct substitution with. Uh, Teagues. So once, once you have the like, negative x squared and then the one in the middle. Correct. Yeah, okay. that's the point. Is I'm trying to find a function that bounds um, the what I'm trying to take the limit of on each side. Uh, it, like, um, so the only reason why, like the original, like so for that for that uh, inequality mm -hmm. right there at the bottom one, the mm -hmm. only reason why we're able to, like, like we had negative one and positive one was because it was a sine equation, right? Yes, this was like from the unit circle that so we remembered. In other situations where there isn't, like where, you know, you don't know it, it's like a non-trigonometric metric function, like how would we be able to find those? Here's here's the yeah, so fair question. Here's the great part about most of what we're gonna be doing is most of the other algebraic stuff that you've run into outside of the trig functions are easy to manipulate algebraically. Okay. That you can use your algebraic tricks to break it down into something you can use the limit laws on or use direct substitution on. Okay. So while that can happen. With the stuff that you have available to you. Perfect. Okay. Good. Which is lovely, yeah. right? Um, Jim. It's stuff with a trig in it, yeah. Where it's like, great googly moogly, what am I going to do with this? And it's like, start with the trig piece, build out what you need, and usually that'll you'll get there. Uh, Jillian. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I'm going to answer no to an always question because okay. I haven't thought about it hard enough to answer. Um, that could be a common pattern, a common occurrence. I'll say that could be common okay. at this level, especially. Okay. How do we know when to not just automatically get which bounce? Um. So. Sure. So if this was not, if this was say tangent, is tangent bounded between negative one and positive one? No. So we'd have to try something different on that kind of a situation. Or if you had cosecant or secant or cotangent, where the those all have like infinite bounds, you'd have to come up with something else that was going to do that for you. So what if there is no Bounce or why? Well, you can, but you have to be. We have to be careful. Uh, so let let's just say we have like tangent of one over x. I don't even know if the limit for that is exists or not. Um, but like. Tangent looks like this, right? Um, but all we really need is like something in here that's going to bound it, oh, okay. right? We don't need yeah. to cover the entire thing. I could use like, you know, like some steep parabolas, and that would work, and that could still squeeze there in that thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it just like it's just not necessarily going to be like whatever the function is stuck in front of the trig function is going to be your bounds on either side. It doesn't have to be that way, but you can always find something. Does that yes. feel good? Yes. My answer is I don't know because I don't have the specific problem, and this might be something like. You'd have to, I'd have to know more about what was going on. But ideally, I mean, worst case scenario, I could look at my calculator and just keep picking progressively bigger coefficients in front of the x squareds until I got, I'm like, okay, that looks good. We'll use that. And it would work. Um, is that, yeah. that's not very satisfying, but it, it will, it'll go. It'll go, yeah. Um, does that, yeah. Okay. And and again, ideally, the the candidates, the things that you want for your f and h, I would ideally want polynomials. Like I want a polynomial there that I know that I can direct substitution anything with. Right. All polynomials are any limit for a polynomial you can use direct substitution on, because their domain is all real numbers. So you'll always be able to do that. Which are that's my number one candidate for for doing that. Like you could have just as easily used x to the fourth here. Like there's no reason that wouldn't have worked. Or any even exponent would be fine. You know, x to the six, x to the eight, x to the twelfth, whatever. They'll get steeper, but it's still fine. There's still bounds. They still meet like a little narrow little neighborhood around that a. So. Sometimes you have to be like a little sneaky about it, but as you, at this level, when you're seeing it for the very first time, it's not going to be too sneaky, you know. Um, so, like, let's grab this. Um, so this is just like one of the problems from the from the text. I don't think this was probably one of them that I picked. But it says the direction just say use the squeeze theorem. To show this. Now, Jillian, this one, because we have a sine x there, 
is going to be exactly the same as the previous one. But everybody's okay. You can see that. That it'll just end up being, oh, Like that'll be that'll be what we end up getting and that's okay because we can direct substitution those radicals so that just that would equal zero and we're done right Um, oh, here, let's do this. This feels, this feels like a good one. This one is not so obvious. When I look at this, I'm not even sure exactly uh, what this will end up being. Now, this looks a little bit different, right? It's still got that sign of pi over x on it, but it's now not going to be quite so simple, right? Now, I would still start with this piece that we established earlier, right? Everybody's okay with that? So the next piece I would try to build is this, what am I going to have to do? Well, I if I do the natural log of both sides, like natural log of negative 1 is undefined, and the natural log of sine x isn't going to be what you want, right? But you're on the right track. We're going to do something to all parts of this inequality. I'm just going to raise them all to the e power Everybody's okay with that well if you think about if let's say we just have like one is less than two is less than three right e to the first is definitely smaller than e squared which is definitely smaller than e cubed since e is bigger than one right and even if this was like a negative number, that just means like 1 over e. So that's still, that's super small. Like it's still, if you think about it, with just some real numbers in there, it's like, oh, sure, that holds. I can do that. And if you're ever unsure, if like, can I do that? Like, is that okay? Just make a real numbered example or two and run through it and be like, yeah, I don't see it. There's no reason why that shouldn't work. You know, use negatives, use zero, use like funky stuff to just make sure. But you can definitely do that. And then we can just multiply everything by the square root of x. So I just made the reciprocal there with the negative e, just because it was going to be a little bit neater, I think, to write. And now I'm going to ask, so now we have the whole thing, right? Why does the limit here have to be 0 from the right? Why can't it just be the limit as x approaches 0? It's the square root. Does the limit exist as x approaches 0 for the square root of x? No, man, because it's only got one side to the limit. It's only got the positive side to the limit because all the negative values are undefined for a square root, right? So that's why that, that's why 
you're probably thinking at least initially like, all right, what's up with that? And that's why. So they, again, you do the direct substitution on the ends and you got zero times whatever. Zero. Does that feel okay though? So there's a there's a situation here, Jillian, where we used sine, cosine, or whatever with those same negative one and positive one bounds, but we didn't get just the coefficient, right? Like we had to do this exponentiation thing. Uh, can I ask you uh, how you use like, root x in the third step in those places? Like, yeah, so again, I'm trying to to build out this function. So I had this part already. I had that part built, so I just multiplied everything by square root x. And I do it. So why did you not start off with the entire Because I didn't know what the bounds would be. Right, I have to start with something that I know the bounds for. So I started with that I know the bounds for sine are negative one and positive one. Oh, okay. Paul. Oh, sorry. Down here? Yeah. I took the limits of f and h. And I just used direct substitution to do that. Right? Square root of 0 is 0. 0 divided by e is 0. Square root of 0 is 0. 0 times e is 0. So I just direct substitution. Is that cool? Yeah. And again, like, that's my goal with the... My values for f and h is I just want stuff that's I can simply take a direct substitution object. That f of x is the lower number. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And it and again, the name of it, whatever. Whatever you want to call it, your lower bound. Whether you want to call it yeah. a of x or b of x or f of x or q of x or either one of that's the lowest. Yes. Jillian. And then um how you, oh that's the that's the limit on the right, the right hand, hand limit and the other one's like the left limit. if it's the negative sign in the exponent mm -hmm. okay. and yes. why did we have to use the right hand limit at zero why couldn't have we use the left hand limit at zero because if you think about the square root function there is no left-hand limit oh. for a square root function because you can't square root negatives. Right. Anything less than zero is undefined. So we couldn't have done the limit as x approaches zero for this. So the other is just x and then Oh, yeah, this, sorry, this one should have a plus sign. Yes, that's what you're asking? Yes, 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 yes. 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 Oh. Yes. Well, if you do the direct substitution, this is 0 over e, which is just 0. And this would be oh, okay. e times 0, which is also just 0. Oh, okay. So yes, they are equal. They're not the same limit, but they equal the same, you know, they have the same limit. Right. And that past question, this is No, I okay. Sure. Okay. Um, that closes up section two three for us. Um, if you can hold off on the homework here until looking at it till tomorrow or something, so I have a chance to go through the seventh edition textbook and update the list of problems to match things I actually want you to do and exist in the textbook that you guys should be looking at. I'd appreciate that. Um, I want to uh, do the uh, show you where the multiple choice questions are at and give you a chance to start on those here today. So if you go to the minor name to the bulletin board and find the my AP link, eventually you're going to have to end up doing the show all to find it, but that's there.
this the, no the downloads is not where you want the download is just that registration code oh okay. my ap is under the link section because we're going to the website you guys will do the login because everybody made a login jack you haven't um i don't know how to do that let's look real quick Sixth hour. Well, I have 12 in there. There's 12 of you guys, but. Oh, yeah, yep, there you are. You did it. All right, thank you. No problem. All right. Um, so when you log in, at this little spot, there's a place down here that has like assignments or something. Is there like a little link down here that say assignments? Yeah. Go ahead and click on that. And then I think the active assignment is called like quiz 1.1 through 1.4. So those, those numbers don't correspond to our textbook. The AP has named the topics. Yeah, yeah like the, well, no, there's just like the standards, like the topics you need to cover in the course. So this is covering like the first four standards. Those are things that we did in one point or in the stuff we've covered so far in class. So just, um, just so you know, so if we go and we look at this thing and you click on your guy, it should open up. And these are old AP exam questions, multiple choice questions. Um, so up here, if there's no, um, if there's no calculator here, means this was a question they would have had on the no calculator section. If there is like a little red calculator on there, that's one that would have been in the calculator active multiple choice section, just so you know. Um, so let's uh, just want to take a look at one of these together. Is this when you guys click on? Is this the first question you get, or are they in a different order? I can't remember how I set this up. I don't know that. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, yeah, okay. As you look at your neighbor's screen, do you guys have the same first question? The automobile is driven on a straight road. That's question. That's my fourth question. That's my fourth question. Okay, so they're in the same order. What's your guys' first question? There are two images that graph uh, path traffic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's look at this one. So the graphs of the function f and g are shown in the figures above. Which of the following statements is false? So the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is equal to 0. Left-hand limit goes to 0. Right-hand limit goes to 0. That seems like that's true. So that one's not false. The limit as x approaches 2 of g of x does not exist. Well, the right-hand limit is 1. The left-hand limit is negative 1. That doesn't work but that's what it says is happening so that's okay everybody agree so that was true uh, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x times g of x plus 1 does not exist okay well the limit as x approaches 1 is 0 and the limit of x approaches 1 of g of x plus 1 should be g of 2 which doesn't exist so that, that's, that tracks for me, I think. And then the other option is that it does exist. Oh, uh, f of x plus 1 times g of x uh, as x approaches 1 exists. So that would be 1 for g of x and 2 for f of x, negative 1. So that worked. Oh, this, I'm so stupid. So this is the one right here, right? Because you have zero times. So I think it's, right? Because the limit as x approaches one of f of x is zero. G 
of x plus one, no matter what the set value is. That's just that's just g. That's just, just as x approaches two. Mm -hmm. and that like that doesn't exist at all. Mm -hmm. Good. So the statement is true, right? Yeah. What is going? On? Did we miss some other thing? Because if you go to like so that this, certainly so doesn't exist. That's x, certainly zero. X plus one. Really just has x well, let's let's look at these two. These are the two that it could possibly be, right? Everybody agrees that it can't be a and it can't be b. Does everybody agree with that? So we everyone agrees that a and b are both true statements. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So our answer is either going to be c or d. Okay. Let's look at d. So the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x plus 1 is just going to be f of 2. So that looks like negative 1, right? Just by direct substitution. If I do f of 2, that's going to be negative 1. Everybody agree? And g of 1 is 1. So that certainly exists. So like this is the one that we were like, uh, we have zero times does not exist. Is that does not exist or does is it not does not exist? That's the one I'd be picking because the other ones I'm certain are true. Does <laughs> that? You know what I mean? Huh? No, man. No, man. Correct. Right. Anybody, anybody want to submit with one of ten to just see if we're right? Uh, no. <laughs> you boogers. Uh, I'll take one for the team. Or wait, do you have? Do you have the answers? Like, can you like?